So everybody, this is a big interview. We went on a little bit of a hiatus for about four weeks. I was down in Florida enjoying myself on the bike, working out. Uh, grateful that everybody is back, hopefully watching the program here. Uh, we appreciate you listening to Fire Breathing Rob. Definitely like, subscribe, share. Whether this will be on YouTube, uh, time will tell. Uh, there's a lot of censorship still going on YouTube, even in 2024. We have a great guest today. I'm really looking forward to you know, having him speak to you guys here on the program, Drew Allen. He's a friend of mine. He's really helped me, I would say, succeed in the business, getting me a lot of great guests uh, as far as, you know, people that are conservative, people that just have a lot of things to say and bring to the table. His book is America's Last Stand. Definitely get that on Amazon, wherever books are sold. You can go to your local bookstore and also get that. We recommend that. Uh, to get those uh, small businesses uh, their due. Uh, if you want to listen to Drew's show on one of the podcasting sites, Apple, Spotify, the list goes on and on, Drew Allen Show. Definitely uh, give him a follow on that. A lot of good material. Drew, it's always good to talk to you. It's nice to see you in the flesh for the first time virtually, and I'm so happy we're doing this finally. Hey, me too. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. You know, like like you said, you know, there've been some different complications, but uh, you know, we we talked a while back, and I've been wanting to come on here and talk to you for months, actually. And I'm just I'm thrilled to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Well, it's always good, like I said, to speak with a fellow person that we might not agree with the candidate, but we agree with each other on a lot of issues. I want to talk a little bit about that from the start, but you know, just to go into you know, who you are, and if you could tell the audience a little bit about that, because you've had a journey throughout politics, throughout uh, books, you own that publishing company where you're helping a lot of these, a publicity company, I should say, uh, helping a lot of these authors and TV guys get their due. So let's just drift back and tell the audience a little bit about you and what's going on with you before we dive deep into the book and politics in general. Yeah, well, you know, I am firstly a native Texan. I live in California. I've lived here for a long time, but I, I lead with that because I, I'm a native Texan who speaks fluent Italian. So I'm a little bit of an anomaly. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm I'm mysterious. I'm very intriguing. I must say, um, look, I went to an all male college preparatory school in Dallas, Texas. That's where I grew up, born and raised, and it was a Jesuit school. And so it was very, it was left leaning. Jesuits are notoriously uh, liberal. Uh, that's the environment I grew up in. My parents were conservative. I actually am a conservative as well. Uh, we can delve into that later and explain what that means because people have no clue with these terms today and the way they get bastardized, what that actually means. But my environment from high school, uh, even until till recently, has always been basically heavy Democrat. So I graduated from, from an elitist all-male college preparatory school and went to Pepperdine in Malibu, which is a Christian school. I'm also a Christian. Um, but despite it being known as a relatively conservative university, uh, I was a theater major and had a theater scholarship. So I was not hanging out with people that thought like me. I was an actor. And I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to deduce and understand that that environment is not heavily populated by conservatives. It's Hollywood is a, is a it, well, I mean, it's a propaganda yeah. machine at this point for the left. So, you know, I was an actor. I moved to New York City, uh, was an actor there. And I ended up in Milan, Italy, where I worked for Marc Jacobs in fashion. I opened and managed retail stores. And the fashion world, again, is not conservative. It's left leaning. It's Democrat. It's it's hard left. And so this is this is what I, I, I was in. And so, you know, I speak Italian. I lived I've lived there for about five years, but I spent about two and a half years there with Marc Jacobs. And um, anyway, on and off, moved back to L.A., was an actor again. I produced a movie. And then I found my way after 2020 getting involved actively in politics and then becoming a publicist. And um, so I'm a pundit. I have a, a podcast. I book very famous people, um, people on the Kennedy side. Uh, I've done stuff for Vivek, Vivek Ramaswamy and that team, Trump people. So I've seen it all. I deal with it all every single day. And this is part of who I am is growing up in those environments. And um, uh, here I am still standing. 
But we do have that in common, the Jesuit background, because I went to a Jesuit high school in Rhode Island. And obviously, I feel like that's where my liberal leaning started there, continued into the brainwashing of college, where they really lay it on thick and heavy. And then obviously, after that, into my 30s, and we're both around the same age, as far as that goes, uh, you know, my issue was, and people that are listening to this and have listened to the program before know that my issue as far as changing more towards middle right, I would say, is due to the COVID vaccine injury that I endured back in 2021. And that really opened my eyes. So I am grateful to God that I did have the injury. Not I'm not grateful that I've, I'm going through the pain still to this day, but I'm grateful to God that I opened up my eyes and really saw the light. Because someone like you, Drew, if we were speaking back in 2020, 2019, 2018, I might have thought you were batshit crazy and a dang fool. But now, as we've talked on the phone, as we've talked in person, now I kind of agree with a lot of what you're saying. I mean, I wouldn't say we agree 100% of the time because I think anybody that agrees with anybody 100% of the time is in some kind of cult atmosphere. But I would say that we agree a lot more uh, then, you know, we disagree. And I would say a lot of people like me throughout COVID, and you've, I'm sure, talked to many different people throughout your show and just meeting people through your work. I feel like a lot of people that were on the left and really saw what happened in COVID with the lockdowns, the mandates, and the death and destruction uh, due to the vax have really opened up their eyes and saw the light. Are you seeing that through people too? I mean, look, I, I see it with my work every single day. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard's a client, Dr. Naomi Wolf's a client. Uh, right. uh, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've got a lot of them and these people have had awakenings, um, you know, in Dr. Wolf's case and other people I represent that came from the left initially, the vaccine stuff in 2020 was really the, the big event in their life that caused them to reflect and change their position or allegiance, I should say, uh, from the Democrat Party to at least at a minimum being agnostic, right? Openly searching for something out there. Um, Tulsi Gabbard, you know, left the Democrat Party behind. Um, this is a big thing. I mean, RFK Jr., you could argue too. I mean, he is somebody who um, I think is a net positive for America. And mm -hmm. He's not going to win in 2024, uh, but regardless, I think that that movement is a manifestation of something bigger that's happening in the country, which is people realizing that there's something wrong, realizing that the factionalism that is so deep in this country um, has become a danger, a critical danger to American freedom and prosperity, uh, and that these parties have become a negative uh, in this country. And, you know, you can go back to George Washington and, you know, I, I'm a big history buff. And, you know, when Washington was elected president unanimously, um, there were not political factions. He was elected as an American president and that's it. And in fact, I, I, I every chance I get, I urge people to Google um, George Washington's farewell address to the nation. It goes back, it's from 1896, I mean, 1796, I believe, is the date. But nonetheless, um, his farewell address is he prepared to set the standard, right, and step down after serving two terms is just a work of beauty, of art. It's transcendent. And if you read his warning to Americans, remember, I mean, we had he was the first American president. We were We were just beginning our journey together. And he issued warnings and advice to the American people about what would serve us well. And pretty much everything that he warned about, every piece of wisdom, every piece of advice he gave, we have not only ignored, but done the opposite in this country. And one of the primary things that he said, of course, was to, uh, one, he said that patriotism, for example, should uh, be more important than any local discriminations. Now, I want to point out something. We just saw last Friday a group of, Muslim immigrants who live in Dearborn, Michigan, and they were gathered together, I believe it was at the library there, shouting not only death to Israel, but death to America. So how do you get to a point in America where you actually have immigrants who come to this country 
and live in America and have the audacity to say death to America. Um, this should alarm every American. It's happening more and more frequently. If you saw that happening in Iran, death to America, you know, whatever. The barbarians that belong in the ninth century were used to it. We expect it from Iran and the Ayatollah. But this is happening here in America, and we've let that happen. Well, just to, you know, tee off on your point, and then we'll, we'll move into something else. We've seen with Bernie Sanders, and I know we don't agree with him on politics, but going back to before 2016, he was a person that said, we got to close the border. Bill Clinton closed the border. You know, the Democrats used to be a party for closing the border. Now they just want to let everybody in in the kitchen sink. And they have really went off the deep end. That's one of the issues personally where I said I have to declare my independence and leave the Democratic Party. It's immigration. It's all the transgender craziness that's going on. I, again, I said I went to a Jesuit high school. We had like one or two gay kids. It was fine. There's no problems. We didn't have any of this trans craziness that's going on. And it's all these kids. This is personally my opinion. It's all these kids that some of them are in bad homes. Some of them maybe are addicted to social media, video games. Maybe they don't have a lot of friends. Uh, maybe they're looking for attention. And someone is pushing them through ideology, liberal ideology, saying that you aren't a girl. You are a boy. You aren't a boy. You are a girl. And they're ruining these kids' lives. So between those two issues, along with many others, the Democratic Party has really went off the deep end. And it's not the Democratic Party of JFK. It is not. And I'm not a Bill Clinton guy, but it isn't even the Democratic Party of Bill Clinton. I mean, they've really went off the reservation here where the only people that agree with these people are people that are, again, batshit crazy and are into this really woke ideology. And, you know, it's either right now, as you stated, I'm a Kennedy guy. It's basically only Trump or, or um, Biden right now. And you have to go with somebody that's not <laughs> as crazy and as senile and off the reservation as Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Yeah, yeah, you, you do. I mean, look, you, you have to understand that. I mean, basically what we have right now in America is a Democrat party that is you know, the alpha party, if you will, and they are absolutely tyrannical. Yeah. Totalitarianism defines the Democrat Party. So all they care about is their power and the expansion of that. And the American citizen, of course, is the loser in that scenario. And this is why you have the identity politics, the transgender stuff, gender theory, critical race theory, equity, all these things. All they do is to prevent unity and harmony in America and promote tribalism in its place. So that's why you have a situation like we just saw in Dearborn, Michigan, where you have people that did not assimilate into America, were not asked to assimilate into America, because the Democrat Party for decades actually has promoted something called the, you know, uh, th they believe that America is a salad versus a, you know, melting pot, if you will. And so this is uh, absolutely insane. And it's regressive in terms of um, what it promotes and creates in a society. You know, a lot of this stuff is just pragmatic. I think when you when you push the politics aside, you sit down with anybody who's rational and you just talk about your objectives. You know, is it a good thing to have radical foreigners in your own country shouting death to America? Is that a good thing? I think the answer is no. And so we should address that and deal with that situation. But as I said, the Democrat Party is your alpha party, and then your Republican Party is a bunch of betas, and they are controlled opposition. So they don't have any, uh, they're insecure, they don't have actually any confidence in themselves. They are the uh, female dogs of the Democrat Party. They will simply do whatever the Democrat Party effectively wants them to do, and the Democrat Party says, okay, we'll allow you to have a little bit of power, we'll throw you a bone here and there. Now- we have a two-party system, so my personal opinion as a pragmatist is that, look, the Republican Party does have a rich history. It is a magnificent party historically in terms of it being the party of Lincoln. 
You have to remember the Republican Party was actually born to combat the issue of slavery. You had multiple parties back then in the mid 1800s, and none of them were equipped or willing to go to war, not actually to war, but to go to war ideologically with the South and the Confederacy and the Democrat Party. And so that's why you had the Republican Party that that was born and, and Lincoln was the first president. Now, since then, we've seen certainly a decline in the Republican Party. They didn't switch like the Democrats claim in the 60s where Republicans became racist. None of that actually happened. But you do have a Republican Party that is ineffective, that is also corrupt, like the Democrat Party at large. And so the American people are yearning for a champion, yearning for people to actually stand up for them. And we don't have that. And it's it's not good because we do have a two party system. And if you just tank the Republican Party right now, all you're left with is a Democrat Party and then you're really screwed. I agree 100 percent. Again, for people listening, Drew Allen, the book is America's Last Stand. Definitely get it at Amazon, your local bookstore, Barnes and Noble. You can also find his podcast on all the podcasting sites. We don't have to name them all. It is the Drew Allen Show. You know, every politician, whether in my lifetime, I would say whether it's Bill Clinton, uh, Hillary, Obama, uh, Bush, the list goes on and on, have said when it's election year, this election is the most important election of our lifetime. The title of your book is not that, but it seems like it fits in that criteria. So why would you, what would you tell somebody like me that says, they say that every year that it's the most important election of the lifetime, whether it's an election year as far as a presidential or it's a midterm. What would you tell somebody that says that and they say, it's not really that important. Life will go on. It's going to be another four years or two years where there's another election that happens. I would say that in the past, even when people said that about the election, you would be correct. I would say in 2024, that's no longer true. I would say that in 2024, the election is actually existential in nature. Um, I argue actually in the book that 2024 is an inflection point in American history, and it is as important as 1776 with the American Revolution and 1861 with the Civil War. Um, if you look at the unprecedented nature of the attacks on Trump in terms of trying to put him in jail, the political lawfare, this kind of stuff can't be permitted. Um, this is election interference, and whether you like Trump or don't like Trump, this is part of the problem in America. It doesn't really matter if you don't like a politician. We have to exercise self-restraint. That's what's held the country together for so long. So just because you don't like somebody um, doesn't mean you can go about evading the law, bastardizing the law, uh, weaponizing the justice system to destroy political opponents and Americans in this country. We have a constitution and we have to all swear uh, to uphold it. And I'll answer the question more in a second, but the big problem we have in America right now is that we have a government, we have politicians, we have bureaucracies, the FBI, and so on and so forth, that are in violation of the Constitution. They have broken the law themselves, but they also control the apparatus that brings about justice. And so you have politicians who have gotten away with crimes. You have Joe Biden, who will never be properly investigated. We all know what he did. The Democrats can lie and try and dismiss us all, all day long. But Joe Biden took money from foreign countries, including the communist Chinese, the greatest enemies of America, in exchange for policy decisions. The border situation alone is treason. That is the correct word for what's happening. So who is going to hold the government accountable? See, this is the problem. We have these, these lawsuits going on, for example, that are trying to prevent Texas from enforcing border laws. Yeah. We, are, we have the federal government going to war with Texas over trying to secure the border. We've never had this in America before because technically, yes, it should be the job of the federal government to defend the border. In fact, you swear allegiance to America. But you have a situation where they're the ones that aren't upholding the Constitution. So what are the American people supposed to do when you have a government that is violating the Constitution? 
Well, you have to read the Declaration of Independence and it gets very uncomfortable for people because obviously nobody wants to go down that route. I'm not I'm not promoting that route, but I'm just saying when you have a government that is tyrannical, who is to rein them in? Yeah. Just to interject and push back a little bit, when we talk about someone and I, I do agree what's happened to Donald J. Trump in the past few years, even when he was president of the United States, has been disgusting. And the media honestly should want him to be president of the United States again because they were dr bringing in the money. That was every story was about Trump throughout his presidency. And, you know, Les Munoz, I believe he was the president of CBS, said that Donald Trump, whether we like him or not, he's bringing in, he's the cash cow. So they should love him and want him to win the election. Uh, besides the point, we talk about somebody that's fearless against these institutions, such as the FBI, the CIA, the list goes on and on. I personally go to, and obviously I'm a little biased because I support this man. You know where I'm going with this, Drew, is RFK Jr. He said on multiple podcasts that when they said, are you worried about getting killed like your uncle, like your father? He said no. He said there's things bigger out there than death. And when I hear that, I think of a man that's truly fearless, that doesn't really give a damn if he dies or not. He gives a damn about the country. Again, I am not questioning Donald Trump's patriotism. But when I hear that from a, another man, that's pretty impressive when the they killed his father and his uncle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't take that away from RFK Jr. I think that's a strong character trait, but I don't think it's any different than also what what Trump is facing in many ways. I mean, Trump is in the situation where he has a family history where they've been targeted and likely assassinated by the U.S. government. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's whole there's stories out there about the potential that, you know, Hillary Clinton was beside, behind, of course. Uh, Wouldn't you say it's more of a character assassination with Trump? I mean, RFK has had some character assassination issues, too, especially during COVID. But he has, I feel like, more of an issue with a regular assassination than Trump does. Maybe you disagree. Well, I don't think so. It's only recently that RFK Jr. has bucked the Democrat Party in, in such a yeah. way as to run as an independent. I mean, nobody, nobody, including RFK Jr., nobody in American history has been persecuted to the extent that Donald Trump has. And in fact, no president... In history, no no former president has ever been uh, indicted for any crime committed. And of course, the situation with Trump is that he hasn't actually committed any crimes. Not a single right. one of these cases is actually a crime that he's committed. I mean, they tried to pull him off a ballot uh, over an insurrection when he hasn't even fa been found guilty of an insurrection. In fact, he was exonerated for that. Well, that I mean, insurrection thing was a joke. I mean, that's yeah, another story for another day, but yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, you, you gotta continue. be, you gotta be stupid to think an insurrection <laughs> happened on J six and you gotta be even yeah. stupider to think that Donald Trump is the one that was behind it. I mean, uh, I mean, I can get into that all day long and talk about why right. that happened, but, um, yeah. but the point is Bill Clinton actually committed a crime. He perjured himself in front of a right. grand jury when he denied having sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. Uh, he also obstructed justice and so on and so forth. And he got let off the hook. They charged him, I think, you know, 20,000 bucks or something to get his law license back or something like that. But 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 that's my point. So what they're doing to Donald Trump, I mean, again, it is election interference. And my point is you cannot allow a political party to get away with this, because if they get away with it now and if Joe Biden wins and it's because of this or so on and so on and so forth, we do not have a country anymore. It's not just demoralizing. But the, the Democrat Party has created a situation in America where, honestly, whether whether or not Trump or Biden wins in 2024, no one's going to accept the election results. That's the problem. Yeah. As far as the election interference, just going back to 2020, I agree with that. I'm not in the whole ballot game of it being rigged with the ballots. I am in the game with the election interference when they did not bring any of that Hunter Biden stuff out when they censored it on Twitter, when they censored it on Facebook. That was definitely 100 percent election interference against President Trump with that. As far as the ballot stuff go, I haven't seen enough. Uh, maybe we well, disagree let me, let me put on it this that. way. Let me put it this way. So first off, let's just assume that there was no interference with the ballots. I don't believe that. I, I think the mail in ballots 100 percent. Joe Biden did not get 81 million legal votes. 
he is not more popular than Hillary Clinton was. And he's not he's certainly not more popular than Barack Obama was in his first term. So anyway, but that that aside, we know based on countless surveys and so on and so forth that had the American people actually known and been told that the Hunter Biden laptop were real, that information alone was enough to have changed the election results, despite everything. So that alone was election interference. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, and the other thing I would say is. If Democrats were so confident that they won 2020 fair and square and that Joe Biden is, in fact, the most popular president in American history, even though there's no evidence of him being popular anywhere. But let's just say, OK, he got 81 million votes. So shouldn't they be salivating over the chance to face off with Donald Trump again in 2024? Because he's the easiest candidate for them to beat. Well, and yet, Joe Biden, but Drew, Joe Biden's senile. I mean, come on. <laughs> I know, That's but he got Biden. 81 million votes. I mean, a senile guy got 81 million votes is what well, I'm saying. Well, I mean, he was he was senile then too, but he was a lot sharper then than he definitely is now. I mean, we can agree with that. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party is very good at rigging elections. Regardless of the 2020 election, we saw what happened in 2016 and even in 2020 in the Democrat primary. Bernie Sanders got rigged in 2020 and in 2016. I lost a lot of respect for Bernie Sanders after both of those elections because he ran with Hillary Clinton as far as doing rallies and running around on her beck and call to do whatever the heck she wanted. And the same thing with Joe Biden. He stood with Joe Biden. You just got rigged out of two elections. Again, regardless if we like Bernie Sanders or not, he should have been the Democrat nominee in 16 and in 20. They rigged it twice. They went against Bush in 2000 uh, with Bush and Gore with uh, say that was rigged. I mean, they always couldn't even in 2004, if we want to go back to that with uh, Kerry and Bush, they said Ohio was rigged. So the Democrat Party will say anything they can as far as when they lose an election, that it is rigged. If you want to have the last comment, Drew, on this, and then we're going to move on to just some audience questions and a few other questions. Well, sure. I mean, the hypocrisy obviously is unignorable on the left. But if you think about what a joke the persecution of Trump is over questioning election results, because fundamentally, some of these cases, that's really what it's about. They're well, saying Hillary basically it's illegal. did the same illegal. thing in 16 in yeah. Michigan. Yep, and she was yep. complaining about Jill Stein. Joe Biden is complaining to go about RF Kennedy, RFK Jr. Now they are very nervous to run against these people. They say they're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. If they're so cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, why are they getting 20 percent of the vote or 10 percent, whatever it may be in between? You know, because people are sick and tired and it's what are you going to do for me? What have you done for me lately? And the people say to Joe Biden, you haven't done anything for me lately, Drew. Yeah, well, you know, the propaganda can only take them so far. I mean, we just had a report that, you know, inflation's risen for the third month in a row, row now. And people need to remember that inflation, it's cumulative. It compounds. So grocery prices are actually about 40 percent more than they were in 2019. So if you say for when Joe Biden would say, for example, you know, well, inflation's down 2%. And he, he'll say, okay, you know, last last month inflation was 7%. This month it's 5%. It doesn't mean that anything got, got cheaper. It means that last month prices increased by 7%. This month they increased by 5%. So that's how it compounds. And they told us it was transitory. I mean, they have lied about everything. If any American has self-respect, they cannot vote for Joe Biden, period. The guy himself, of course, is a serial pathological liar who tells the same lies over and over and over again. But th think about this. We know, as a matter of fact, that the border crisis is a consequence of the Biden administration's policies. He bragged about rescinding all the executive orders that Trump had put in place and bragged about the fact that he had opened up the border. This is what he bragged about. This is what Mayorkas bragged about. And then they told us that it was Trump's fault and they wanted to secure the border, but they needed Congress to act, that the president couldn't do anything. That was the big lie they were telling three weeks ago. Well, now the border issue is so unpopular. It's so bad for the Democrats that that issue alone 
is capable of tanking any chance Biden has at re-election. So now what do you have? You have the left-wing media pumping out stories that Joe Biden is now considering taking executive actions to secure the border, which is what? An admission that they were lying, an admission that they can, in fact, secure the border on their own within a, w- without an act of Congress, because the problem isn't we need more laws. The problem is they won't enforce the laws that are on the books. So think about this as an American citizen. You're going to vote for a guy, Joe Biden, and Democrat Party that just lied to your face for three plus years telling you that they couldn't do anything about the border. And now they're saying, oh, the election's a few months away. We're going to close it down. Yeah. Drew Allen again. It's America last, America's last stand. Excuse me. The Drew Allen show on all your podcasting sites. Uh, Drew, you know, just kind of putting the exclamation point on this. I think it's more likely than not that Donald Trump does win the pres- presidential election on November 5th of 2024. Let's play the hypothetical game. What happens, do you believe personally, if Donald Trump does not win, whether it's a rigged job? I, I honestly think that's the only way it could go where he doesn't win. But, uh, you know, even if it's not a rigged job, we'll say hypothetical. Well, the Democrat Party right now, their plan of action is to use the 10 million plus illegals they've imported into the country and facilitated the invasion. They're going to use them to vote. Now, you have to understand it's not that complicated. These individuals are being flown into Philadelphia, other places. And in fact, you can go and look up video of these uh, some of these illegals being interviewed. And they're, they're asked, OK, well, where are you going once you get into the United States? And they pull out a piece of paper and it's like, the Civic Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So somebody's directing them to these places. Now, where, where Democrats control legislatures, all they have to do is like in California, motor voter. So motor voter is you are registered to vote when you get a driver's license. But of course, to get a driver's license, you don't have to prove citizenship. So there are a couple of things going on with social security cards and also driver's licenses. And so all you need is you need live ballots. So you need to just get these people registered to vote so that you have, when you have a mail-in ballot situation, you've added 100,000 names to the list. So that's 100,000 ballots that you can say, hey, these are on the list when it comes down to lawsuits and everything else. So the question is, are there going to be enough illegals that can convert into voters to help save Biden's re-election chances? I think they're very worried that they can't even do it with the illegals this time. Last time they had COVID and so on and so forth, but mail-in ballots are key. Now, the second thing they're trying to do is the Hail Mary of the abortion issue. And they are they, they understand that there's not going to be voter turnout for Joe Biden. I mean, people aren't going to show up to vote for Joe Biden. That, that That's really what's going to happen. Some people are going to vote for RFK. Uh, you know, other people just aren't going to vote. And that's the bigger thing because it's about who shows up. And there's obviously a lot more enthusiasm behind Trump voters than there is Biden voters right now. So they need something to get those voters to cast a ballot or show up. And so they're hoping they can make the abortion issue. And most of it's artificial, by the way, what they're doing. Most of the stuff they're saying, even in Arizona, isn't even accurate. Yeah, I know California is a cesspool as far as that goes. You used to live there. You know the song and dance very well. Oh, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, That's true, actually, (laughs) I forgot about that. I, I had the little brain fog uh, attack for a second. But regardless of that, Gavin Newsom, the governor, he obviously went toe to toe on Fox News with Hannity uh, months back uh, with um, it was Fox News. Hannity moderated. Uh, he was there with uh, Ron DeSantis. I thought Ron DeSantis made him, made him look like a dang fool up on stage. In fact, there was also talking points that uh, they were supposed to go for more time. And Newsom's wife said, hey. That's it. We're done uh, and during the commercial break. But regardless of that, there's been a lot of talk that you pull Biden out, you put Newsom in. He's a good looking guy. He's a tall guy. He's slick. He's kind of skeevy to me. He seems like a used car salesman. Obviously, he's your governor. You know this backwards and forwards. Do you see them putting him in there? Because you maybe have a better chance at winning because you have a young, slick, used car salesman guy running against Trump rather than Sleepy Joe that can't even debate him. So Gavin Newsom certainly has ambitions to rise uh, to a position where he can be a a future president and lead the Democrat Party. Um, The Democrat Party is not interested in him uh, right now at large. And frankly, uh, I'm not scared about Gavin Newsom. A lot of people 
say exactly what you've said and go beyond that to say that he could win and they're scared of him. I'm not scared of him. I live in California. He's run this state into the ground. His record is just as shameful as Joe Biden's is on a state level. We're, we're running deficits right now. He's full of garbage. And he's not that slick. We saw him go up against Ron DeSantis and Ron DeSantis cleaned his clock. So he's not that smart. He's only good when you insulate him. So he'd have to run a basement campaign like Joe Biden, even though he doesn't have the mental excuse and physical excuse. So, no, I'm not, I'm not bothered by by Newsom. Um, I, I get it. He's a nice looking guy, more or less, you know, the, the snake skin or whatever, you know, that's on there. But but uh, I, I'm not worried about it. But secondarily, um, you know, people who have been speculating that like, oh, Michelle Obama is going to be the nominee no, instead or whatever. Chance. I've said um, you guys are wrong from the very beginning. And 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 it's, you see, people who think that Joe Biden's not going to be the plan A or the plan B, see, they're thinking rationally. Now, the Democrats aren't thinking rationally like someone else. They're not looking at the situation like everyone else. Now, Joe Biden is the greatest gift the Democrats have ever had. He's been the most destructive president in American history. And that's because he's totally controllable, absolutely controllable. And it's a big ordeal to try and swap out a candidate to build the infrastructure to run somebody. So no, I mean, he was like this. I mean, he's gone downhill since 2020, but you can go back and look at 2020. He wasn't that much better. That's the truth. He wasn't that much better. And so they just want to get him across the finish line. I mean, look, the Democrats put themselves in a situation where there isn't really an exit strategy. That's the reality. Kamala Harris, they they like her less than Joe. They don't want her in there. So they don't they, they have believe it or not, these strategic geniuses where we think like every string is pulled and everyone knows the outcome of it. They don't. They went with Joe Biden because it made sense in 2020 for them. They could present him as like the moderate Joe guy, even though he wasn't. And now they're stuck with him. That's what's going on. Well, they didn't want Bernie because they couldn't control Bernie like they could Joe. Again, whether we like his politics or not. I do have about three audience questions. If we could take a quick commercial break, Drew, and bring you back. Yep, absolutely. All right.